I'm glad that each of you are here today for Palm Sunday 2022. So when you think about Palm Sunday, you think about a commemoration of the entrance of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, where there were palm branches that were placed on the path before him and, and waved as he was coming in to, uh, to Jerusalem before his arrest that took place on the Thursday and his crucifixion on Good Friday. As many know um, here today, I, I've been preaching through the book of Mark, and today we're going to jump ahead a chapter, and we'll be revisiting uh, chapter 10 after the Easter season, but because it's uh, approaching the Easter season, um, I think we're going we're gonna to move ahead to chapter 11 today, and uh, then we'll backtrack after the season is over and, and fill in where uh, we can learn some from chapter 10. So, today we're going to be moving into chapter 11 of, of Mark. And um, long ago, there was a prophecy that was given concerning the coming of the Messiah to the Jewish people. And, and, and this prophecy was given by the prophet Zechariah. And this particular prophecy... I guess you, you could say that it was obscure. And um, it involved the prediction that the king of Israel and the ruler of the world would come to Israel riding on a donkey's colt. And the reason I say that it was an obscure prophecy is that it was so unusual to hear that their king would be coming to them riding on a donkey, that I think probably when the original listeners to Zechariah heard this prophecy, they might have asked themselves this question. Surely, this is not how God would choose to send his Savior to us, his King to us, a Messiah riding in to establish his kingdom on the colt of a donkey, not just a donkey, but the colt of a donkey? Surely, you, you must be mistaken about this. But, but nonetheless, we read in the scriptures and the prophetic words that came out of Zechariah's mouth. In Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, the prophecy was given. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Wow. Normally, when you hear something like this or, or read a, something like this, with, with most people's understanding, in the ancient world especially, a king would generally come onto the scene of his coronation dressed in his finest clothing, riding on a majestic war horse as a status symbol. The king riding on a war horse would typically signify to everyone watching the procession that the king was powerful, that he would be in control over his realm, and that he would also have great influence over other realms. And when, when horses are mentioned in the Bible, they're almost always in relation to kings and war. Well, generally, when you look at references to donkeys, they're mentioned in relation often to common people. And I should mention, though, that in the ancient Israeli world, there were times when a leader would also come riding in on, on a donkey to signify his intention to bring peace so that, that was there as well. But 
here is where we find ourselves in the biblical narrative. Zechariah predicted that the Messiah would come from out of the tribe of Judah and, and he would make his appearance in a humble, lowly demeanor. And the prophet Micah, he also backs up the prophet Zechariah where he predicts that the Messiah would be born in a small town. And we hear this scripture around Christmas time a lot. But in Micah 5.2, the prophet writes, But you Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come forth for me one to be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old, from days of eternity. Furthermore, when you look in scriptures, Israel, the patriarch Israel, not the nation, but the founder of the nation, the patriarch Israel, also called Jacob, he prophesied that the Savior would come from his own family line. When Jacob was blessing his 12 sons before his death, one of the things that he said concerning his son Judah is written in Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 to uh, the first part of 11. And he said this, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. Wow. So here's another prophecy talking about the one who would come from the root of Judah, would tie his donkey to a vine. And not just the donkey, but the donkey's colt would be tied to the vine. So if you look at the combination of these prophecies, like pieces of a, a grand jigsaw puzzle coming together, you would see that the promised savior of Israel, first of all, he's most certainly going to be a king. And the prophets predicted that his kingdom's realm and rule would not only reach across Israel, but his prominence and his influence would reach and extend to the very ends of the earth. He would not come in a fashion one would typically expect for a king to arrive in. A typical king would in splendor be riding on his high horse. But this prophesied Savior, this Messiah that God would send, although he would carry a ruler's scepter of authority, and he would command the obedience of the nations, he would arrive in a state, he would arrive in a state of peace and humility, making a lowly entry on the day of his coronation. Riding the colt of a donkey. A humble beast. The donkey is a beast of burden. And the donkey has been signified as a representative of peace if in symbolism. Also well-being. National greatness. Whereas the steed, the war horse represents military might and conquering. Now, when Jesus first coming, he came on a donkey, and we're going to talk about this. There is coming a day, though, where Jesus will ride the steed, and that's his second coming. But we're talking about his first coming. The heavenly Lord's entrance into the world it spe speaks in the prophecy, would take away the chariots of Ephraim. You know who Ephraim is, right? Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph. They became the half-tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, and they came from Joseph. 
It says, the heavenly Lord's entrance into the world would take away the chariots of Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem. In his kingdom, the battle bow would be broken. In other words, the entrance of this Messiah, Savior, King into the world would usher in a kingdom of peace that would be established in a different way. It wouldn't be established in the same manner as kingdoms are normally established with fighting and with warfare. The kingdom of the Savior would proclaim peace to the nations and bring a message of reconciliation into the world. The kingdom of the Messiah will control, will control territory with no enemies of concern in victory. The prophet Isaiah also spoke of this coming king, right? There's many prophecies in Isaiah that talk about the coming Messiah king, the the king of the Jews, the king of the world. Talks about who this king is. In Isaiah 9, 4 to 7, and this is also sometimes read at Christmas time, the prophet Isaiah says, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders." And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Fast forward. Fast forward from that prophecy and these prophecies that were made. Fast forward to the very first Christmas morning where the Messiah from the tribe of Judah, whom Zechariah, Micah, Jacob and Isaiah prophesied about he was born into the world in Bethlehem, a little tiny village. Heralding his arrival, the host of angels came to the shepherds, singing praises to God, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. That was what the angels sang. And Jesus was born. And Jesus was, was growing, and he became a man. And over the past several months, we've been exploring the life of our Savior, his miracles, and his ministry as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. You know, on a number of occasions, the majesty of the king in the presence of his disciples, the majesty of the king tried to reason with them. He tried to tell his disciples that he was in the process of establishing his kingdom, a kingdom that was different. Not in the same manner that people would expect an earthly kingdom to be established. The kingdom of Jesus was not, and I repeat, it was not about political control. It was about spiritual transformation where men were given the opportunity to become at one with their heavenly father. There was reconciliation in this kingdom. It was meant to bring peace, peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. The kingdom of Jesus meant that there was an opportunity for people of the world to come to peace with God and to come to peace with one another. 
And the disciples didn't quite understand what he was getting at. And he tried on numerous occasions and he tried to explain this. They were thinking that the Messiah would come as they had been taught by many teachers of the law. As a great military and political leader like King David who would be kicking out those Roman tyrants from their system and reestablishing Israel as a world power. They thought Jesus and all the work that he did in his miracles was all about setting the stage. It was setting the stage, but not in the way that they thought. In fact, after seeing Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, we talked about this several Sundays prior to today. We talked about the transfiguration where Jesus revealed to his three disciples, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John, his glory unveiled. And, and, you know, that event made those disciples think, and I'm sure they talked amongst themselves, that Jesus was strategically planning out how they were going to be riding with him as he, at any time, would come out on the high horse and take his kingly authority like any good king Messiah would do. The truth of the matter is that Jesus was not setting the stage for a political kingdom at that time. No. He was setting the stage for people to come to peace with God and with others in a grand spiritual kingdom of the heart. The King Messiah, whom Jesus was the fulfillment of, was to be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is what he desired, to bring about peace between God and sinners who desperately needed redemption. In last week's message, the words of Jesus ring loud and clear and true in a principle of what Jesus describes makes a good leader. If you recall, in Matthew cha- or Mark chapter 9, 35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. So, we jump ahead into chapter 11, where we see Jesus. Here we see Jesus entering Jerusalem, exemplifying the very model of servant leadership that he was promoting and that he was telling his disciples made greatness. In preparation for his mission on earth to be fulfilled and the establishment of his spiritual kingdom, Jesus fulfilled all that the prophets before had spoken of him. Reading from Mark 11, starting with verse 1, about the triumphal entry. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead, then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as though it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. In the history of ancient Israel and other Mediterranean cultures, people waved palm branches to celebrate great victories. Kings who were returning from battle victories were often met with celebrating people as, they, as the king rode into the capital city on a majestic steed. But here is Jesus, the Son of God, not dressed in kingly finery, not riding on a majestic steed. Here comes Jesus into Jerusalem in complete fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9, and 10, riding on a lowly donkey's colt that had never been ridden before. The donkey never bucked him off. It knew its place. It knew who was sitting upon his sh its shoulders. And here came Jesus walking with this donkey, on, riding this donkey into Jerusalem. Cloaks, you can imagine, cloaks being laid down before him. Palm branches being laid before him. Palm branches being waved. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This quote was taken from Psalm 118, 25 and 26, which was written. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. That's what they were referring to. And portions of this psalm, right, that I just read here, were sung by the Jews during their Passover celebration in his, what was called the Halal. And all the people were looking forward. They were all looking forward to the coming of the Messiah King, particularly at this time in history, around the Passover Everyone had been hearing the wonderful stories and the miracles that had been coming from the countryside surrounding. Even dead people were being raised back to life again. And they had high expectations for Jesus to be the Messiah. And the excitement and the enthusiasm was building as he approached Jerusalem, much to the distress of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the teachers of the law who did not like his teaching and did not appreciate his humble approach. See, they were looking for a different kind of Messiah than one who was riding on a donkey's colt. They should have known they should have known what Zechariah had prophesied and what they are seeing in front of them, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus confronted these men in, cha in chapter 543 of the book of John, and he stated, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me, but if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. See, Palm Sunday complicated things. It complicated the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law plan to get rid of Jesus. Jesus was a threat to their institution. And he wasn't playing by the way that they thought he should. And they were going to, they were going to get rid of him. Even though they would have studied the prophecy of Zechariah. In John chapter 12, 17 to 19, it is written in the parallel um, story of this triumphal entry. John 12, 17 to 19, it's written, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Now look how the whole world has gone after him. And when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem... It says further in Luke chapter 19, 37 to 40, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in a loud voice, or in loud voices, for the, all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest. 
some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So Jesus entered Jerusalem as the creator of the world, as the creator of the whole universe. He came into Jerusalem as a servant, as the Messiah, Savior, and King. All the prophets had spoken about him. Doing this was setting the stage for what was about to happen and how Jesus was going to give his life for the sin of the world so that men would not be bound by the penalty of sin but could be set free by his work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. He was entering Jerusalem at the cusp of the Passover celebration. And for those of you who are not familiar with Passover, this is the time back in the Old Testament when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And God was sending plagues upon the oppressors, upon the slave drivers. The nation of the Egyptians was being plagued. And there was one final plague that the death angel would come and visit the homes of Egypt and everyone would lose their firstborn son. And God made a way for the Israelites who believed to escape the death penalty that was coming upon the land. If they would take the blood of the lamb blood of a sacrificed lamb and would take the blood and put it over the doorpost, the threshold into their home, the angel would pass by and would not visit that home. That home would be spared death. The angel would pass over that home and move on. You see, this happened. And the Israelites, they put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, which represents the entryway into their homes. And the death angel passed them by. And they were delivered from slavery. God set them free to go out away from their oppressors. See, this was the celebration of the Passover, was this occasion. And Jesus, coming into Jerusalem... They didn't quite get it. He was coming in on the Passover. He wasn't coming to take control over the political realm that they were living in. No. He had a higher purpose. He was coming into Jerusalem to become the sacrificial Passover lamb who would give his life and permit his blood to be shed for the sins of the whole world. He would make a way for the sinners of this world of which you and I are part. He came to make a way so that we could have forgiveness. So that the penalty of sin that brings death to all men because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God would pass over those who applied the blood of the Lamb to the doorposts of their lives, to the thresholds that the entry point into their lives, into their hearts. When the blood of the lamb is applied, the death angel passes over. And Jesus was the lamb. Jesus was the creator of the universe. And he gave his life because of love for his creation that he willed that none should perish, but that all should come to obedience and repentance and be made at one with God by his precious blood that was shed. This is the significance. See, Jesus came as a servant. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. God loves you. He loves you if you've never known him. Open your heart. Open your spirit up to the living God and ask him to come inside you and to wash away your sins. 
This is the celebration of the triumphal entry that the king of all kings, whom thousands upon thousands times millions upon millions of angels bow before and cast their crowns before him and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Those creatures, those angels and people that have passed on before us, that stand before the throne of God crying, holy, this same God who is higher than any name, who is a higher being than anyone in the whole universe, he loved his people that he created so much that he veiled himself in flesh and he came to seek and to serve and he came on a donkey's colt as a signifying um, sign that he had come to serve the ones that he created. How great a love that the Father has for us that he should offer his one and only son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for our sins. It is written in John chapter 1, 17 and 18, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God. You ever wonder if Jesus is God? There it is. I'm going to read it again. For law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. In John, chapter 14, 27, Jesus said this. And this is, this is the whole crux of what I'm trying to tell you today. Jesus said, my peace I leave you. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. My friends, Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. My Savior has given his life for you. His blood was shed so that you could be passed over by the death angel. So that you could be given hope and a future and eternal life. So that it doesn't matter what happens in this world, no matter how hard it is. God is with you and he will never leave you. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He is a good God and he loves his children. Don't hold back. Your Savior has given you everything. Your Creator has given you everything. Make this Passover, this is the start of the Passover here. Make this Passover a time where you look to your Savior and you see how he humbly served you and you come and you accept the gift of love, the gift of salvation that he gives freely to anyone who will believe. This is the triumphal entry that the king has come to serve. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, Learn to be a servant of all. And Jesus was the master demonstrator of leadership and is the one that we need to follow.